Thank you. Thank you so much, sister. It's lovely to see you. And, you know, I'm so happy that uh, you're hanging in there with the Anu Kampa project. And, you know, even it's not necessary or smooth going, you know, and it takes time. It's, uh, you know, you have to just stay with it and then things will open up. You know, with us, it was just like that. And, uh, you know, I thought it's going to take about five years to come to the place where we are now, you know, with our project. And it took actually 10. It took double the time, you know. And uh, so, and, and, but not the day was kind of wasted because it's all practice anyway, you know, the whole uh, setting up, developing a community and developing a, a place. It's all grist for the mill. And so we need to have some kind of an occasion, you know, where we can notice where we are at with our practice and setting up a bhikkhuni vihara is a worthwhile um, thing to do. So, you know, I wanted to start today with uh, the Arahant Bikuni chant, which we have here, and this is the Loka Vihara chanting book. And I wanted to chant that, you know, as a blessing for you and for your project, uh, Chanda, and then also, you know, for everybody on the call today, because I think we are all going through very unsettling times now, you know, all around the globe. And, uh, you know, any lineage of blessing we can connect with is is very helpful you know for steadying ourselves in this time and that's exactly what we need you know to be grounded and then to really look into our hearts you know what is our calling you know inside of this huge uh, human experience we call evolution you know what is our calling so that we can you know live our practice and embody our practice in a way which is inspiring for us and which also is benefiting other sentient beings. So I'd like to start with the chant and uh, this chant is based on a Sutta and the Anguttara Nikaya and it speaks about the 13 foremost uh, Arahant Bhikkhunis at the time of the Buddha. And I have received the chant many years ago from uh, uh, Bikuni Ramananda, who was then Dr. Kabil Singh, and he, she's one of the foremost, you know, uh, outstanding nuns in Thailand at the moment who have been really very much trailblazing. And uh, she gave me the text many years ago. I don't remember, maybe like uh, even, I think it was in the early 2000s, I think. And, and then uh, I was thinking we can guide, guide you into a meditation and then I would read out the chant in the English translation as well and you know for you to just take in the blessings of this lineage of the bhikkhunis you know which is very ancient and you know they those bhikkhunis mentioned here in this chant they have lived as contemporaries you know alongside the bhikkhu sangha at the time of the buddha and still you know we remember their names because the buddha has been praising them for their qualities and they have also left us the poems of the Terigata, which you know is one of the few works from the Bali canon which made it into world literature really which have been translated you know so many times into also into english and now it gets translated into other languages as well so to connect with that lineage of blessings that can give us a sense of uh, strength, you know, in times where there's so much uncertainty. So I'm just going to chant it and you just open your minds and hearts, you know, and just receive the blessings. <clears throat> Ratan yu nang bikuni nang gotami chinamatu cha tapita akatanam hisata so ting karotu wo mahapanyanang akata ke materi tipakata Savika puta seta sasata so ting karotu wo teri upalavana chaiti mantina mutama Savika puta seta sasata so ting karotu wo 
Vinaya tari nangaka pata charati visuta tapita akatanam hisata soting karotubo tamakati kanang pavara tamadina tinamika tapita akatanam hisata soting Karotuvo Chayikanang Pikuni Nang Nanda Teriti Namasa Agatana Tita Ahusata Soting Karotuvo Arata Viriana Naga Sona Teriti Namika Tapita ta 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 nam hisata so ting karotuvo. Dipa cha kukangaga sakula iti visuda. Visuda nayana sa pisata so ting karotuvo. Kuntala ke si pikuni ki pa pinyana mutama. Tapita yevatanam hisata soting karotuvo. Teri pada kapilani pupachati namanusari. Tasang yevapikuni nang sata soting karotuvo. Teri tu pada kachana maha pinyana mutama. Chinena sukatukang sa sata soting karotuvo. Luka chivaratari nanga ka kesa pikotami. Tapita akatanam hisata soting karotuvo. Sikala mata pikuni sata dimuta namutama. Karo tuvo maha santing arogyan cha sukhang sata. Anya pikuni osapa na nakunatarapahu. Palen tuvo sa papayaso karo katisampawa. So tapan ya tayo seka sa tapan ya siladika. Pagaso kile sa tahana sa taso ting karotuvo. So that's the text in Pali. And uh, now just find a, a posture, you know, you can sustain for about 30 minutes. In the bringing the body and the mind together. But just you know, becoming aware of the weight of the body sitting on the cushion or on the chair. And maybe you know, feel the energetic quality of this uh, listening to the chanting that does something to the body. It certainly does something you know, to the energy of the one who is chanting. Simply being aware of the body, breathing in and breathing out. And whenever the mind you know, wanders off, which it naturally does, just gently bringing it back, familiarizing the mind with uh, you know, an object which isn't particularly exciting. It's just the body, just the breathing. Just nature. Okay. 
So I'm now going to read the translation into English. Recollection of the foremost Arahant Bhikkhunis. Among Bhikkhunis of long standing is Gautami, maternal aunt of the Buddha, attained to the supreme state. May the power of her qualities always be a blessing to you. Is foremost in great wisdom, K. Materi is renowned, disciple of the excellent Buddha. May the power of her qualities always be a blessing to you. Upalavana Teri is the highest of those with psychic powers, disciple of the excellent Buddha. May the power of her qualities always be a blessing to you. As the foremost among Vinaya experts, Patachara is famous. Attained to the supreme state, may the power of her qualities always be a blessing to you. As the foremost, sorry, as the most excellent of Dhamma teachers, Dhammadina is named, attained to the supreme state, may the power of her qualities always be a blessing to you. Among nuns who cultivate meditation, Nanda Terry is named. Established in the supreme state, may the power of her qualities always be a blessing to you. As the foremost of energetic ones, Sona Terry is named. Established in that state, may the power of her qualities always be a blessing to you. As the foremost of those with the divine eye, Sakula is famous. With seeing well purified, may the power of her qualities always be a blessing to you. Kundala Kesi Bhikkhuni is the most excellent of those with quick intuition. Established in this very state, may the power of her qualities always be a blessing to you. Bada Kapilani is the foremost of those remembering previous births. May the power of her qualities always be a blessing to you. Bada Kachana Terry is the greatest of those with higher knowledges. Having conquered pleasure and pain, may the power of her qualities always be a blessing to you. Kisa Gotami is the foremost of those wearing coarse robes. Attained to the supreme state, may the power of her qualities always be a blessing to you. Sikalamata Bhikkhuni is the highest of those resolved on faith. May the power of her qualities always bestow great peace, health, and happiness on you. May these and all the other qualities of the Bhikkhunis dispel all fear, sorrow, and illness. Those who are stream enterers and all others in training, endowed with faith, wisdom, and virtue, with impurities partially burned away, May the power of their qualities always be a blessing to you. And now, you know, if, you, if you're able to do so, just, uh, you know, bring up at you, in your mind or visualize one of those bikunis or a group of bikunis. and feel their, their wisdom and their steadiness. You know, and how they can care for themselves and for others from a place of strength and love. And just, you know, let them show you what is possible for you too. And you know, the, smile at you and you smile back. Because it's those very same qualities, you know, which live in you. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to recognize them or visualize them. You know, taking that mirroring from them. 
receive it uh, fully, you know, and fill your body, your heart, and your mind with those qualities being of strength and love and courage, you know, being mirrored back to you. And then, you know, the bikuni reaches under her robe and, and pulls out a gift for you. And, you know, you reach out your hands and she puts a little gift into your hands. You know, it's a bit, she's going to be a clear symbol of what you need to practice with in order to develop that steadiness, that grounding, that courage. And just, you know, look what it is. And if you can't quite see it, maybe you have to unwrap it or hold it to the sunlight to see what it, what is it? A very clear symbol. Of what you need to stay steady, loving and strong in these very difficult times. And then you can just, you know, thank her with a little bow or a word or so, and just thank her for the gift of reflecting back to you your own potential. And she says, you know, we are here and you can always connect with us when you need a boost. To steady your heart, to clear your mind. You know, to have that steadiness and love in the midst of it all, in the midst of great uncertainty. And just feeling, yes, you too, we too, we all carry that potential, we all carry that courage, love, clarity, just need to trust it and live from that place as much as possible and be conscious, you know, when we are in chaos, be conscious that's fine, that builds a lot of resilience, being able to hold steady with internal and external chaos. So really taking that in, breathing that really into the, down into the body, down to the tips of the toes and the tips of the fingers. And then whenever the mind starts to wander off, which is natural, just courageously dropping that thought, dropping that habit, and just coming back to the simplicity of the present moment. And allowing, you know, allowing life to speak for itself rather than constantly commenting on everything. For now, we can just allow life to speak for itself as body, breathing, whatever is happening now in the mind.
So and for the remainder of the meditation, it's another 15 minutes or so, I leave you to yourself.
and for the last few minutes of the meditation to really look at impermanence in the body or in the mind, sounds, I'm not sure if you hear the sounds on the, on the roof. I do hear them. I hope you don't. <clears throat> Lots going on here. Movement, which is life is movement. And the Buddhist teaching is all about, you know, having a, mind which is clear enough and grounded enough so that we can start to understand those patterns and have a perspective on the, those patterns inside and outside the skin so to say And from that, you know, from that understanding, from that wisdom, then make the right choice and respond to these deep-seated qualities in our being. The calling, how it's called in English. You know, what are you called for this lifetime? And if we are really coming from that place, if we are really connected to that place, it's much easier to stay grounded in the midst of great uncertainty and difficulty. It doesn't need to be a, like a big thing, but just what is it? gives you that sense of being connected with yourself and embodying that in the world and at the same time not getting lost and being swallowed up this is the middle way that's how the teaching of the Buddha is called also. To so, you know, really live your true values and at the same time to penetrate into the depth of life. The meditation doesn't solve all of our problems magically, certainly not. But it gives us that foundation from which to meet them. And that's as good as it gets. And this is, makes all of the difference. You know, to meet life with an open heart and with an open mind. And, you know, the Arahant Bhikkhunis, they very much uh, embody that strength and that gentleness at the same time. And at a time, you know, where there is so much change and uncertainty they come back to us you know in our lives now because we we need that gentle strength
and cultivating that uh, <clears throat> resiliency by opening to whatever is happening and being, you know, based, have this foundation of the teachings and our individual qualities and strength through which we embody them in our lives. <clears throat> I have unfortunately forgotten again to bring a bell, so Avram Chanda, do you have a bell handy to ring? Otherwise we have to do without. Please ring it, sister. You are you're muted, Chanda. Can you ring a bell? Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so, uh, when Chanta has asked me, you know, what I'd like to speak about, and she suggested, why don't you speak about your journey, you know, into the bikuni robes and beyond. And uh, yeah, and I thought that's, I like to speak about that. And, uh, and I'd like to, you know, speak about the teachers who have most influenced me on my path and, and, you know, what I've learned, which quality they, they embodied for me and reflected back for me so that I could actually find it in myself. And that's what a real teacher does, you know. He or she holds the gold, your own inner gold you already have, and shows you, you have it yourself, you don't need me. But just for some time, you know, there's that mirroring happening, and, and then when it's finished, then you move on. And then there might be like another teacher who mirrors back another quality, and when that's digested, you move on. And so it goes, you know, until we are really firmly grounded in our own inner teacher. That's what it's all about. And, uh, you know, the Buddha is the supreme teacher because he, you know, by himself found this ancient path, how it's expressed in the suttas, you know, which was, it's not that he invented the Dhamma or anything, but he just, his mind was such that he had the sensitivity and the strength of mind to, recognize it and then even to express it you know which is even what which is also very difficult you know to express what you have learned so he had both of those gifts and that's why he is like so special why he is so uh, you know respected and uh, highly thought about because he had those qualities and uh, so now I start about my journey. I'm on that journey too, you know, and I'm so glad that I met this teaching because I was rather struggling <laughs> at this time, you know, when I felt I was ready for something completely different than what I had been doing all the time before. And, uh, you know, I had been uh, studying cultural anthropology in Vienna and, uh, worked in a quite successful uh, dance theater in Vienna, which some of the Austrian people might know. It was then called the Serapions Theater. Now it's called Odeon. And, you know, and I was really, um, you know, looking for some meaning in my life. And that 
those, you know, the studies and the theater as well, they gave me some kind of uh, inspiration and uh, I was certainly interested, you know, but whenever it was about, you know, having skills for daily life, they couldn't offer much in that regard. And then when my mother suddenly died from a horse riding accident in uh, 1986, when I was 28 years old, I really, uh, you know, that, that need for some kind of guidance on what life is all about really exploded open, wide open. And I just felt like I really need, need to have some framework. And, and as it said, you know, generally when the disciple is ready, the teacher appears. And so it was with me also. I had traveled, you know, to Thailand with a friend and uh, and one day I found myself on a bus station in, in Suratani in the south of Thailand and there was like a, a young western man there with a shaved head all dressed in white, which, you know, is a rare occasion to see a western man at that time in this, uh, in the south of Thailand and I went up to him and believe it or not, he was Austrian. I mean, that was very, very kind of a surprise for me. And he had gone to the same hotel management school as I had gone just two years before me. I had never met him. So and then I said, oh, you're looking rather strange. You know, what are you doing? And then he told me, you know, I'm in this monastery of Ajahn Buddha Dasa and it's about 40 kilometers from here. Why don't you visit, you know? Because I was at that time writing on my thesis about Thai dancing and you know, that kind of dance is the classic Thai dance. It's the equivalent to our ballet, I would say, you know, in the West. And it deals a lot about the Deva realms. And so it's deeply connected with Buddhism. So I thought, you know, I need to know a little bit about Buddhist uh, life and need to look inside of a monastery. So, okay, I, you know, gave up my ticket, which I had to go to a certain island and jumped on a song tail and a pickup truck, you know, and uh, went to that monastery. And when I came in the door, by some coincidence, three days later, a meditation retreat started because they had every month a 10 day meditation retreat at Watsu and Mok in Thailand. So I said, yeah, I'm, I'm just going to stay for three, four days because I can't sustain 10 days. But and then I just, you know, quick, uh, quietly squeeze out the back door and nobody will notice so and then i was at that retreat and then the there were two main teachers it was Ajahn buddha Tassa, who was at that time already in his early 80s and his american translator santicaro biku and you know and when i met them there was just something very powerful going on in my heart you know i felt like i understood you know I didn't understand much English then, and I did not understand any Thai. So I did not understand much of the verbal teaching, but just their presence was enough, you know. I immediately recognized, you know, this is something very much in the direction what I'm looking for, you know, some kind of a foundation for a life, really. Something really, um, sturdy and uh, and then you know i was contemplating what is it what is it what is so powerful you know in so a palpable presence of the especially of the old Thai master what is it and and then to my dismay it was like kind of yeah it's about ethics it looks like you know he has no remorse and he is totally grounded in just being who he is and the sense of equanimity of really being fully yourself because you have no remorse. So then I, I all kind of edited it all up and I was thinking, yeah, I'm not very good on the ethics front myself at this time. And uh, so I felt inspired, you know, to kind of shape up and uh, and then, you know, at that time I was married with a, with a man in Thailand and I had a pretty uh, rough 
life in some ways. And uh, so I kept returning back to the monastery again and again, you know, and then I really noticed, you know, when I'm in the monastery, I don't need a lot of stuff, what I need when I'm outside because of all of the difficulties I had, you know, I needed certain kind of uh, ways of um, distracting myself, you know, really. And I just didn't want to do that anymore. So I ended up getting divorced from the, my husband and then moved to the monastery, you know, which was rather like a classic kind of career. You know, you can hear about women doing that. I would never thought that I would ever do this, but it happened. And, uh, and then I stayed there until my teacher became, you know, very, very ill. And it was clear, you know, he would not live for much longer. So then there was the question, you know, what's, what I'm going to do next? I don't know. And I was just like opening up myself and suddenly I found the chanting book in English in the Dhamma hall there. And it said Amaravati Buddhist Monastery, England. And then I thought, okay, I'm going to go there next. And then, you know, we didn't have email then and this was 30 years ago or more. So I, I wrote a letter and then I had to wait a long time to get a letter back. And then they were saying, yes, you can come. It's not going to be what you think, but, you know, you can come. And, and I went there and, and I never left, actually, for a very long time. I, I became an Anagarika. And the resident teacher there was Archan Sumedho and the Siladara Sangha. And... You know, that was a, a time of where I felt really very well held, you know. It was, a, it was a time of really being able to dismantle a lot of myself, you know, because of the structure which was there and the teachers and the support. And there was a real kind of transformation process happening and a training at the same time, you know, training to be a nun. And I was there for... From, two, from 92 till 2009, with some short, you know, breaks when I was going on pilgrimage to India and things like that and traveled a bit to Nepal and Thailand also. But almost uh, the whole time I was there at Amaravati and also Chithurst. And um, I learned about the value of Western psychology. The Nan Sangha did a lot of uh, psychological group work together. And we were also supported, you know, to have individual therapy. And, uh, you know, it was all about, you know, don't give up. Just keep, keep opening, however difficult. Keep opening. And we were supported in that, you know. And then uh, around half time of my time at Amaravati in Chithurst, I... Uh, through another you know, chain of coincidences, I met my Tibetan teacher, Shechen Rapshun Rinpoche, who is the grandson of the very famous teacher, Dilgo Kienze Rinpoche. And I met him also you know, by coincidence again at the Kala Chakra teaching of His Holiness the Dalai Lama in Graz in 2002. And it was also like completely unsolicited, you know a recognition between the teacher and myself and um, then I kept visiting his monastery in Nepal several times and then you know through through the connection with him that brought in a complete different element which I can't really find so much in the Theravada it's like a sense of dynamism and energy and the arts are very much used also you know for opening the heart and the mind and, uh, you know, I just had to allow it because it was pretty scary to me because the connection was very much like on this kind of mis mysterious level, you know, you could say. It, it was... Uh, I've never experienced that before so uh, strong, you know. With my first teacher, Ajahn Buddha Dasa, there was also a very strong heart connection. 
you know, but there was not much teaching necessary. But then with my Tibetan teacher, it was much more extreme that that side, you know, because they are really very uh, skilled at that. Because they have this, you know, element of the shamanism and the bone culture, which is the foundation on which Tibetan Buddhism was built. So they, they use those avenues of communication and also through art, dancing, music, and paintings and uh, gestures and costumes and implements. There's a lot going on, you know, and because I was coming from the art world and I've studied that in the past, I was very open to receive that communication. And that's exactly what I was missing in the Theravada. So it came together for me in that way. And then, uh, you know, because Amaravati Buddhist Monastery and the lineage of Achan Shah, they do not support bhikkhuni ordination. At one point, you know, after being there for like over 17 years, it became a little bit like hitting the ceiling, you know, the glass ceiling. And there was no way for shifting. They were not ready for that and they are still not ready for it 10 years after I have left. So just note that one, which is kind of sad to me. So then... Again, you know, that was when I came back from a, a long pilgrimage to India and Nepal uh, at the end of 2005. You know, I, I just felt like I don't fit anymore into that Amaravati box. You know, I've seen too much. What should I do? You know, I'm a siladara. I can't handle money. I can't cook. I have all of these monastic rules. I can't go anywhere. If, if, not, if there's not some opening, you know, some, some foundation of support. So again, it was just like the same thing, you know, I was just sitting with that open question and bang, an invitation came, you know, from America. We would like you to make a branch monastery for the Siladara Sangha in the Bay Area. And, you know, in America, no, we don't want to go to America. It's too crazy, this country which is kind of pretty true, actually, after living here long enough. So it didn't feel like very attractive, I must admit, you know. But then we were struggling around, you know, for another two years. And then there was the uh, conference on bhikkhuni ordination in Hamburg in 2007, which was called by His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And then after that conference, even, you know, there wasn't any real results in terms of the allowance you know for ordination but it was very clear you know bhikkhuni ordination is possible there is no obstacles for that other than in the minds of the monks and of some other people and then after that you know amaravati buddhist monastery and the whole bhikkhu sangha they started to really crack down on us nuns you know and it all escalated, you know, in 2009 when we were given what's called the five points. We had to, you know, basically pledge to abide by the five points, which means, you know, that we're going to be forever and ever junior to the monks. We ever and ever going to be novices because that was the Siladar ordination was kind of a mix between Samaneri and Pikuni ordination. And yeah. So that was the story. And then, I, and then, you know, the whole nun sangha broke kind of apart and half of the nuns disrobed. We were about 25 nuns at that time, I think, kind of. I, I'm not exactly sure, but we were quite a few nuns and also anagarikas. And so half of them disrobed and went back to their respective countries and professions and, you know, did things. And half of the nuns just, stayed there and me and Ayananda Bodhi, who spoke just I think a few weeks ago also for you, Ayachanda, right? And the two of us plus two other Siladara, we, we took up this invitation, you know, to make a branch monastery here in America. And then after meeting Ayatata Loka the universe is is um, scringing, isn't it? 
So, so we left in 2009 and, uh, you know, we started Aloka Vihara in San Francisco and we met Ayata Taloka, who is, you know, the uh, most senior Western Bikuni, as far as I know. I think I'm going to say something, maybe. Okay, he's gonna wait. He's gonna wait till eleven thirty, my time. Okay, so yeah, what, what did I say? Yeah, um, uh, yeah, we met Ayata Taloka and her sangha, you know, and it became very clear what Ayata Taloka is doing here. That's the true inheritance which the Buddha has left for the nuns, and we cannot you know, set something up and say to people, no, come to us. We are like from the famous Amaravati. We are the Sila Dara, you have to come to us. We are having a much better training. It just didn't really add up. So it became clear to us, you know, if we want to stay in America, we need to leave the Ajahn Chah lineage and we need to become bhikkhunis. And then I, uh, Ananda Bodhi and myself, the other two nuns dropped out in different ways. And then I, Ananda Bodhi and myself, you know, we left the Ajahn Chah lineage in 2011. We went back to England and bowed out, you know, took leave and said thank you for everything. And then we came back and six months later, we ordained as bhikkhunis with Ayatata Loka as our preceptor. And Jack Hornfield was also very supportive. He, you know, made a spirit rock available as a venue for our ordination. And Jack Hornfield had originally been a monk also in the Archon Char lineage. So he felt like, you know, we were from the same family. And afterwards, you know, he invited us continuously, you know, to teach retreats and day longs at Spirit Rock. So we had a lot of exposure and that was very valuable for us. And also Joseph Goldstein and Sharon Salzburg invited us to teach at IMS. So we suddenly, you know, we had to completely kind of shape up and teach like the really big gatherings. And we were very scared in the beginning. But we had to do it because that was our only way, you know, how we could uh, put down some roots. And, and we did it. And now I'm grateful, you know, that, that I've, I've done it. And yeah, so that was great. So Jack Kornfield, Bhikkhu Bodhi, also Bhikkhu Bodhi helped us a lot by really, you know, speaking with our board and explaining to our board the importance of what we are doing, you know, and that it is okay to leave the Ajahn Chah lineage behind formally because Ajahn Chah and Ajahn Sumedho and the teaching we received also from the Sila Daraya will always be in our heart. That's our foundational training in monasticism and you know that will never go away. But we just needed to open up. So you know, that was like a synthesis of everything that has gone before for me. You know, the, the foundation in ethics and equanimity from Ajahn Buddha Dasa, the strength of the monastic container and the healing which can happen inside of that from Amravati and Chithurst and then the dynamism and the mystery, you know, from the Vajrayana. And then it all synthesized into one something, which is Aloka Vihara now. And, uh, and then later also, you know, Venom Analeo, who was actually on at our ordination at Spirit Rock and Ajahn Pramali was there as well. So, you know, some of the, of the monks who have been, you know, really standing up for the bhikkhunis. And then, uh, uh, when Manalia, you know, started to teach more in America, he, he now lives actually on the East Coast and benefited a lot from his teaching, from his clarity and structure, a lot. And 
and then also my friend and mentor Ken Motrolma, who is a bikuni in the Kagyu tradition, who has really helped me you know, to get a handle on the Vajrayana and how to live that as a Theravada nun. And there was also Chetsuma Tenzin Palmo, who has always been a mentor to me as well. And Anna Nabodi and myself, we taught a retreat with Chetsuma two years ago at the Spirit Rock. Spirit Rock is a very, you know, a place where so many things are possible. Where Vajrayana and Theravada teaches together, where Bikuni ordination can happen. There's a lot of um, innovation happening there. And also, you know, many years before, Ajahn Amaro and Sokni Rinpoche taught together also at the Spirit Rock. So that was a very beautiful opportunity. And, we, and uh, Chetsuma taught about the Terigata as well then. And I and Bodhi and myself were the sidekicks and she was the main teacher and we just, she taught on the poems and we were teaching guided meditations, you know, to the qualities she was speaking about on that day. So that was a very beautiful way of working with her together. And also maybe that's interesting. I finished the Ngöndro, you know, which is the preliminary practices in uh, Vajrayana Buddhism, which is a, uh, you know, like about 800,000 things to do. Prostrations and mantras and visualizations and all of that. So it took me seven years to do it, you know, on the side, so to say, because I had to, you know, work and set up a Loka Vihara and be teaching and so on. And then in my kind of free time, you know, I was getting the Ngöndro done and that was very important for me as well, to have that foundation, you know, which is a, a foundation which is very much built on devotion and on the willingness, you know, to kind of not know when you're ever gonna finish with it. And if you're ever gonna finish with it, because it's so many things to count that you give up, you know, the, the, the linear mind can't really deal with it. It gets too frustrating. So I think that was very helpful as well for me. And uh, so, you know, and now I'm 62 and now I'm wondering, you know, what's the next step? Because Aloka Vihara is really well established now. And we are now six nuns here. We are four bhikkhunis, uh, one samaneri, and one anagarika at the moment. And, and for me, you know, my next step is now, I feel like to start to teach in my mother language because I've never done that before. I've taught maybe two short weekend retreats, one in Switzerland and one in Hungary. And that was the only thing I ever did in German. So I feel like to really connect with the teaching in my own language will bring it deeper. And that's why I have now started, you know, together with Sabrina to work on the Terry Gata poems. We just started last week ago, actually. And also, you know, I try to visit uh, Esther's group in Vienna whenever COVID allows for that. And looks like it's not going to happen this year. So I'm in the process of developing some kind of uh, online teaching with the group in Vienna twice a month. And uh, if, you, if anybody of the German speaking people are interested in that, you could write to me on our website. And once we have it, you know, up and running, then I could, uh, you know, send you that information. We're gonna, we are planning to start in November with the regular teachings. So, you know, what I wanna actually say with, now he's still doing it, I don't know. Still drilling out there. Uh, oh, yeah. It's okay for us. It, we yeah, don't hear it much, yeah, don't okay, worry. Good because it sounds like kind of very loud here. <laughs> and I think that what I wanted to kind of accept, you know, what I wanted to express with my story and you know, about my path was, you know, once you really connect with this inner calling, the universe is, comes to your aid, you know? It's just like, 
suddenly you meet that person, you find that book, you get that invitation, you know, things are just like, and it was always, you know, the most important turning points. I've written it down, you know, because so I, I don't lose track. I can see, you know, the most important turning points on my journey, it was always things which came from outside, so to say, you know, outside of myself, the meeting the man at the bus stop in, in uh, Suratani, then, you know, um, finding the chanting book in Suan Mok, then having that mysterious kind of communication with my first Tibetan teacher, getting the invitation from America, and then also, you know, now meeting uh, some people from the meditation group in Vienna. It also happened, you know, through Archon Suchato, uh, uh, a monk who came by for a one-day visit here. So, you know, I've really developed that faith or that trust, you know, that if, if we are really opening our hearts and minds, we will be guided. But what we really, what's really needed is to have that sense of, of grounding and uh, stability so that we can actually hear, hear the call, you know. Because I don't know how many calls I didn't hear, but those few I did. And that was, is good enough for me, you know. But I couldn't have made that up by myself. It, there's really a, a call and response happening, you know, and, and that depends on the, on the clarity of our mind, you know, on the development of our minds and of our hearts. And, uh, you know, the Buddhist teaching is all about that and it's about, you know, developing the seven factors of awakening, you know, um, sensitizing the mind so it can see clearly what is going on. It's not having a different experience than what we are having, but really seeing into it and seeing through it. And then, you know, we're going to be changed and then we're going to meet our experience in a different way. And that's where we have a power. You know, we can change ourselves. We can't change the outside world, but we can change ourselves. And then our experience of the outside world is changing because our minds and our hearts getting bigger and bigger. And that, you know, reminds me, and that's, I'll close with that example, you know, that sutta about the lump of salt. You know, if you have a lump of salt and you put it in a small cup, it's going to taste pretty terrible. But if the lump of salt drops into the Ganges or into Lake Tahoe, it's up the road from here, you won't taste it. Well, <coughs> just a little. Because the mind has a lot of space. And things can come and go. And they can be food for practice. Because, you know, all phenomena yield liberation as their essence because they are all empty of a self, impermanent and unsatisfactory. And that's where I'm ending. And if you have any comments or questions, we have another 20 minutes, right? Thank you. So Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll do Ajahn Brahm style sadhus. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you. <laughs>